get started. Uh, my name is Sean Sloan. I'm the Program Manager for Transportation Policy at the Council of State Governments in Lexington, Kentucky. I want to thank you for joining us for this CSG Policy Academy on the future of the federal role in transportation. Uh, with MAP 21 set to expire later this year, uh, the Highway Trust Fund set to run low on cash even earlier, and little evidence of any agreement in Congress over how to fund a sustainable uh, federal program going forward. Uh, the traditional roles played by federal and state governments are once again under scrutiny. Uh, we have four folks with us today who have given some considerable thought to what the federal role should be and uh, who have uh, some fairly different perspectives on, on that issue. Uh, so here's our, our lineup of speakers, uh, and I will give a few more details about their resumes as we go along. Uh, we have Rohit Agarwala from uh, Bloomberg Associates and Columbia University, uh, Emily Goff from uh, the Heritage Foundation, David Levinson from the University of Minnesota, and James Corliss from Transportation for America. Following our discussion, we will have our guests respond to questions and comments from our audience, and you may enter your question into the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Uh, we will collate those and uh, ask as many as time allows. Uh, Rohit Agarwala, I want to turn to first to you. Uh, uh, Professor Agarwala leads the sustainability practice at Bloomberg Associates, a philanthropic uh, consulting firm serving city governments. He advises uh, former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg in his role as the Special Envoy for Cities and Climate Change of the United Nations Secretary General. He is also a professor of professional practice in international and public affairs at Columbia University and co-chairs the Regional Plan Association's fourth regional plan for the New York metro area. Uh, he previously served as a special advisor to the chair of the C40 City Leadership Group and as director of New York City's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability. Uh, Professor, you wrote a, a piece for Bloomberg View last January uh, entitled, Want Better Roads? Kill the Gas Tax. And here's a bit of, of what uh, you said. You, you wrote that, a strong, smart, well-funded federal program would be great, but if Congress can't pass one now, it should just get itself out of the way by eliminating the federal gas tax entirely and cutting Washington's role in surface transportation. He went on to say that it would be a big change in streamline government, and it would probably lead to more investment in infrastructure and greener transportation policies. Can you expand on, on what you mean by that and why you think that would be the case? Sure. Thank you, um, Sean. Uh, and can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, you know, the, the idea behind the piece is um, in part the simple two things. One is that from a political point of view, generally devolution as a concept has been embraced more by the right than by the left. Um, but of course, you know, I come from the sustainability side of, of the advocacy and research world, the urban side, so consider myself more aligned with, with those concerns, less about shrinking government for its own sake. Um, but one of the things that as I've been looking at transportation policy more and more, I realize is that <clears throat> the states that make their own, that raise significant amounts of their own money for use, locally tend overall to have greener policies than the ones that have uh, that rely more heavily simply on their federal uh, funding right which leads me to think that there is a correlation between a willingness to pay taxes or tolls for transportation and both the level of infrastructure investment and the greenness of those investments Right? That's one idea in this article. And then you couple it with the fact that uh, the average American tends to think that the gas tax entirely goes to Congress um, and is spread across the country and nobody sees it, which is, I think, one of the reasons that we see uh, generally local tax initiatives to fund transportation succeed because where people have a sense that they are getting what they pay for, they are willing to make these investments. While the idea of raising the national gas tax seems to be politically anathema even to the same people. And so if you put those two ideas together, what I was 
what I was pointing out is there should not be a contradiction. In fact, there is a synergy between devolution in this field um, and better both more money getting invested in infrastructure and those infrastructure policies being more focused on transit and more focused on, uh, on sustainability. Right? And the mechanism here is simply the, the realization that, as we all know, um, basically the Federal Highway Tr Trust Fund and the Transit Trust Fund have become less so for transit, but the Highway Trust Fund certainly has become a pass-through with a bonus that almost every state gets eh, more or less what they pay in terms of the gas tax. So the path through Washington that the federal gas tax takes doesn't create any value. It is not, as it was 30 or 40 years ago, that this is a federal program that is being spent without respect to state lines because we are building a national highway system or something like that. It is now simply an allocation mechanism. And I would argue the states can do that better. And if you have that discussion on the state level about what the right funding mechanism ought to be, should it be a gas tax? Should it be a toll? Should it be something else, as they did in Virginia? Um, and what is the right level? What is it that we want? Uh, you should get much more effective transportation policies, much healthier funding mechanisms, and frankly, you would force a number of states that have been ignoring this topic, like New Jersey, for example, to confront the fact that they've got to make an active decision about how to fund uh, transportation. You know, in the year and uh, nearly a half since I wrote this article, of course, we've seen, what, something like a dozen states go ahead and grab this bull by the horns because they felt they were running out of uh, the spending um, that they needed to be able to do. But I think still the idea of forcing every state in the union to have this discussion would be tremendously helpful to the quality of overall transportation policy in this country. I, I think, you know, uh, despite the fact, though, though, that we saw several states um, that were able to, uh, to increase transportation revenues in one way or another, and, and uh, despite the fact that we've seen much more success uh, in states raising uh, the gas tax in recent years uh, as opposed to, to raising the federal gas tax, despite all that, um, it's always a significant challenge to get a, a state transportation funding package across the finish line, even when it's uh, clear that, that all of the conditions are, are demanding action and, and you have all of your ducks in a row politically and, and coalition-wise and, and so forth. And I'm sure folks in, in Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and all these other states would probably say that. So isn't it just as likely, though, under your scenario uh, that, you know, faced with a cut in, in federal transportation money that some states would simply continue to underinvest and, and let infrastructure fall into decline rather than, than facing the politi political consequences of higher taxation at the state level? I think, you know, you'd probably find some states do that, no question. And it's potentially uh, reasonable to ask the question of whether there are some states that actually ought to spend even less, right? But, <clears throat> but we do see over and over again that in some of the states, first of all, the states with the largest populations seem to be correlated with the states that are willing to spend more. Um, so your New York's and California's Places like Texas, of course, that have been pioneers and very much at the cutting edge of using things like tolls and, and public-private partnerships to construct infrastructure. You know, what, what you see is that the states with the largest amount of need are also the ones most aggressive about raising revenues. So it doesn't worry me if a handful of states or even if 15 states actually don't succeed in addressing this, in part because it sets up the potential so that the next gubernatorial race or the one after that could hinge on the fact that, look, we've got to get our act together because it's going to hurt competitiveness in whatever state if we don't address this. And that is exactly the kind of thing that kind of dynamic that has led to the successful state funding programs and the success of most of the local uh, 
transportation, you know, whether it's sales, ta sales taxes or other mechanisms, when here's what the need is, it's local, here's a plan to solve this need, here's how much it's going to cost, and here's a mechanism by which we're going to fund it. That is generally a political strategy that works, right? But saying, oh, the Highway Trust Fund is going bankrupt, we need to raise the national gas tax, it's just a non-starter. And I think in many of these states where, uh, first of all, it has to be done as an initiative, right? As opposed to, in this case, you know, if the federal government put all the states on notice that three years from now your funding goes away, and by the way, three years from now your gas tax drops down by 18 cents, um, all the states, it's kind of a deniable thing because then they can say, look, I didn't want to start this discussion locally here in, in this state, but because of this change in federal policy, I have to. As opposed to saying, oh, wait, we've got to fix this problem and we've got to do it before or instead of or on top of whatever Washington does. Far easier in that scenario to assume, well, you know, Washington's the problem and that's, that's uh, impervious to a solution. Um, so in any case, I think I'm repeating myself, but I think it is uh, the idea that by removing one of the players, bringing the question much closer to home, because at the state level, um, people will see more direct correlations between the taxes they pay and the quality of the roads or transit systems or what have you. Um, and then accepting the fact that some states may make bad choices. Um, but that that's what statewide elections are there to solve. Um, I think that's the, the bet that this would be making. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, and, and please stay with us. Uh, certainly some provocative ideas there to, to generate some discussion as, as we move forward here. Uh, again, if you have questions for Professor Agarwala or any of our speakers, uh, you may enter them into the GoToWebinar Go to interface at any time, and we'll ask as many as time allows at the end of the event. Uh, Emily Goff is also joining us uh, this afternoon. She is a transportation and infrastructure policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation's Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies in Washington. Uh, in that role, she researches and writes about ways to reduce and reorient the federal role in transportation policy in favor of increased state and local control uh, over their transportation priorities. She writes about privatization, competitive contracting, and eliminating and phasing out federal transportation programs that may be best done by the states or in the private sector. Uh, Emily, you put together a short presentation for us here entitled, uh, Bringing Transportation Decisions Closer to Home. Why, why don't you take us through that? Great. Uh, first of all, I'll just say thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me, and um, just looking forward to a rich discussion. Uh, I had just a few slides, and uh, the, the points I wanted to go over will, will be uh, connected to these slides, but really I intended the, the key points that I wrote there to really be take home. So um, for those who are, are on this call listening, feel free to just take these with you and use them uh, going forward. I designed them to be talking points and, and points of reference for you. Um, so I guess starting off, I uh, put together this big paper with a, a coworker who has actually since departed and gone to the Hill uh, to work uh, with one of the members that we, um, uh, of whose legislation we discussed in the paper. So kind of a, an interesting connection there. But the paper we put together uh, really at its core is what, what I, you see there on the screen there. It's all about bringing transportation decisions closer to home. The idea being that people on the ground, uh, ordinary citizens, state and local officials, and then private sector actors on the ground know their transportation priorities uh, better than Washington does however well-intentioned uh, folks here in Washington might be. And uh, as was just said, that they are uh, perhaps better positioned to identify and address those problems um, uh, cost-effectively. Uh, I want to just say, we can go to the next slide, I want to just uh, speak a little bit to the problems that I see with the current approach, um, and then just touch briefly on, on the vision that I would, I would have uh, for, for changing uh, the status quo. Uh, kind of start off saying, uh, the current focus uh, to transportation uh, policy in D.C. Uh, often becomes more about how to spend more money and to uh, have everyone get their piece of the pie than it is actually about addressing problems on the ground. Um, and when we look at surface transportation, the problems that I see that flare up the most are traffic congestion uh, and then issues of mobility, so getting to uh, access to jobs and then really being able to go about your lives 
in a congestion-free way. So the two are connected there. Uh, so those problems are, are ignored often uh, by, by the current structure we have in, pl in place. Uh, the two big kind of red flags that I see with the current system um, are twofold. One of them is uh, the existence of massive spending diversions uh, of money out of the Highway Trust Fund, and the other uh, are the myriad federal mandates and uh, spending restrictions placed on the states that impede their efforts. So just uh, speak first to the, to the one on spending, di spending diversions. Excuse me. Uh, you know, this is really indicative of how the program, the highway program, has lost its way over time. Uh, it was originally supposed to be turned back over to the states once the interstate highway system was completed, uh, but the revenue source, I believe, was too attractive for Congress to turn down. So over time, uh, lawmakers added uh, new activities that were eligible for this highway trust fund spending, uh, this, using this money. Somewhere along the way, forgetting the fact that it is motorists, bus operators, and truckers who are paying the gas and diesel taxes that are funding the system. Yet these new spending activities are not benefiting them. Um, we can kind of debate the, the nuances of whether transit benefits drivers and whether sidewalks are, are improvements. We, we can kind of get into the nitty-gritty at some point. But largely speaking, uh, when a motorist pays the gas tax, they expect to have road and bridge improvements that will make their commute and their other uh, travel, you know, driving trips uh, easier and safer. Uh, so you have these massive spending diversions and just some recipients that you see it on a the slide there. Um, you've got uh, urban mass transit, transportation alternatives, and those uh, refer to uh, things like sidewalks and bike trails, even landscaping on, on Main Street, and then of course metropolitan planning organizations. There are others, but these are kind of the highlights I wanted to hit on. Um, Again, these activities are not inherently bad. <laughs> I don't mean to suggest that when I write um, that they shouldn't be in the Highway Trust Fund. But my argument is that they're not federal priorities, particularly given the budget constraints that the Highway Trust Fund faces, and frankly, that Washington faces in general. Um, and the, their inclusion in the program distorts the decision making that would otherwise happen uh, at the state and local level. For example, if state and local officials have to spend a certain amount of money on sidewalks or streetscaping, they're going to do it because they're told to when they might have other more pressing transportation projects uh, on, on their to-do list. Uh, and then the way of transit, the way we do transit in this country currently and the way the federal government administers grants, I believe biases uh, city officials and states towards the more expensive types of transit. So for example, uh, if, we, if we had a much smaller federal role in administering transportation uh, money for transit, you might see more states switch over to bus uh, rapid transit systems as opposed to building very uh, you know, kind of uh, expansive and very expensive uh, light rail systems. Um, a classic example of that is in my backyard. Um, they're building the Silver Line as part of the Metro Line system when even the FTA at one point said that a bus rapid transit system would have been a better and cheaper alternative, or excuse me, option for them to pursue. So, um, you know, we're, we're raising tolls, uh, money uh, on the on the Dulles toll road to pay for that, um, and it's you know obviously taking a long time and is ex extremely expensive. So, I, I think states would be better off uh, under a situation where we had a smaller role um, for the federal government in transit because they would be forced to make uh, smarter decisions about how they spend their money. Uh, let me. We can go to the next slide. Uh, let me move on and just speak a little bit to the federal regulations and these mandates placed on states. At the core here is this uh, kind of pervasive problem of the federal government meddling in what I believe are purely local and state activities or activities that could be done by the private sector uh, more effectively and at less cost. Um, and you have Washington telling the states how they must spend their money. Um, now, on one hand, you can make an argument that because the federal government is collecting the gas taxes, they should have a say. Um, but we've gotten to the point uh, that the mandates and think regulations such as Davis-Bacon, think NEPA, um, all of these are the things that either reduce the purchasing power of states' transportation dollars or, um, or kind of, um, you know, just delay projects, um, which again causes cost escalations. We've gotten to the point where these things are so pervasive that, I mean, we've, we've definitively tied the hands of state and local officials um, and state DOTs as they try to do more with less. Um, and, uh, you know, we can 
the, the trouble is that a lot of these difficult, these big pieces of, le of legislation uh, and regulation, such as NEPA or Davis-Bacon, I mean, are their own kind of animals in and of themselves, and you're not going to address them in one fell swoop. So I think it's really incumbent upon Congress to um, kind of tackle this this challenge and start shipping away and and, and making those um, those laws uh, kind of streamlined, which I think we saw a little bit of in Map 21, although it's too early to tell how that's going to pan out, but things of that nature, they need to be making progress toward reducing this regulatory burden on the state, um, which is one uh, fantastic way to help them stretch their transportation dollars uh, further. Um, I'll, I'll just speak, uh, finally, just kind of how we go from here. Everyone knows that uh, Congress has no idea how to pay for a, a multi-year, so a six-year highway bill as is uh, traditional. Uh, we're seeing a 15 to $16 billion funding gap in the Highway Trust Fund because spending is outpacing revenues. Um, and uh, you know, we've only seen, for example, the uh, Senate EPW Committee has released its highway portion, but we haven't seen the transit or any of the other, other titles. Um, so I, I'm kind of predicting um, either a short-term patch or a much, uh, you know, very modest bill like we saw with MAP 21 uh, in terms of duration and spending levels at, at current levels. Still the big question is how do we pay for it all? Um, but this really gets to the, kind of the thrust of, of, of a lot of my work underlying the underlying current is this idea that Congress should be increasingly giving states and, and localities more flexibility to innovate, to tap into the private sector, um, and to make those funding decisions, as was just mentioned um, in the previous presentation. Um, it's important to remember also that Congress remembers that transportation is about transporting goods and people. Um, a wonderful byproduct of that is economic benefits. But we run into trouble when our primary goal of transportation projects is to uh, stimulate a local economy or kind of, and I'm doing using air quotes here, create jobs. Um, we lose sight of what the actual problem on the ground is that we're supposed to be addressing with this. Um, so if we move away from a Washington-centric system, at least with regard to surface transportation, um, I think you would see smart decision making at the state and local level. As was already also mentioned, I love the idea that they can kind of pass the buck and say, yeah, Washington made us do it. It gives them an out to be able to make those tough decisions because I get that it is difficult to uh, raise a state gas tax, um, even though we have seen some successes with that. Uh, and just to bring your attention finally to a few pieces of legislation in Congress that are really uh, the latest iteration in such proposals that, have, that, date, that date back to the mid-90s, you've got the Transportation Empowerment Act. Um, and, sorry, we can go to the last slide. Uh, the second, the next slide, and then the, also the State Act, and you see, uh, you know, these proposals would, in some way, shape, or form, gradually decrease the federal role, including the federal gas tax, um, handing that taxing authority over to the states, who would then be able to raise their gas tax by the same amount the federal gas tax decreased, or do, frankly, whatever uh, revenue uh, kind of mechanism works best for their for their situation, and then that their their voters and their citizens. Uh, want to pursue, um, and uh, any myriad uh, byproducts, I think positive effects uh, would stem from that, uh, as I mentioned, increased innovation um, from the private sector, um, especially in cities, as I think we're already seeing now with startups like Lyft and Uber and the like. Um, so this is kind of the, the thrust of what we'll be writing on uh, going forward, and I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, I. Yeah, I have one question for you. You know, you, you talk a lot about uh, the transportation alternatives program and, and sort of having states and locals uh, fund transit and so forth. But you know, it occurs to me if one of the goals of the federal program and, and one of our goals as a nation, and whether it is or not, uh, you know, may be open to some question going forward. But but if one of those goals is to reduce emissions and and reduce the number of a single occupant vehicles on the roads and things like that. Why shouldn't the, the federal program support all modes of transportation? Uh, you know, if more people are riding bikes and transit, that's less congestion, better flow of freight and commerce, less wear and tear on the roads uh, that we have to spend more money to fix later. Uh, you know, why shouldn't investment in transit and transportation alternatives be in the federal purview? Twofold, uh, I would say the first one is, is the one I mentioned that they are uh, local in nature. Uh, well-intentioned bureaucrats, special interests, politicians, or lawmakers, I'll, I'll be generous, they, they simply do not know the individual problems on the ground, however much they might try. Uh, this country is so vast, so diverse, uh, and the needs, frankly, um, are, are, are just as vast and diverse on the ground, even though there might be some commonalities as, as you laid out. The second one, uh, I would say, is that 
when Washington has tried to get in that business, it's failed. <laughs> um, you just look at the, at the Tiger grants um, that started under the stimulus bill. GAO was just out with a report today that said uh, DOT did a poor job in tracking uh, how it administered those grants. Um, I mean, you know, this isn't the first time we've seen a uh, deficiency in the way that the DOT has, has administered a program that uh, I would say these grants, like, you know, more often than not go to uh, livability projects, including transit, sidewalks, other kind of beautification, and so forth. Um, and then if you look at transit, you know, one of the trans some of transit's uh, primary objectives were to reduce traffic congestion uh, in, in cities and in the metropolitan areas and reduce um, emissions, as well as uh, provide mobility for low-income citizens who live in and around the metropolitan areas. Um, now, I didn't write this paper, but a, a close colleague who does some contract work with Heritage uh, wrote a great paper on uh, really evaluating transit performance on, on the, in those areas. Um, and the findings uh, don't shed a, a very good light on transit. Um, for all the subsidies that we spent on transit, and, um, and I'm talking about in the last uh, few decades, ever since we started spending money out of the Highway Trust Fund on transit, because they used to be privately run. Um, you, you've seen just a poor performance. So the emissions reductions we've seen from automobile use have, I believe, been attributed to um, higher fuel economy standards, and will increasingly do that. And when you look at how expensive it is to reduce emissions through transit, I mean, the parts per ton um, of emissions have, uh, reduced are astronomical. So. You know, I think there are smarter ways to go about it if that's the goal. Uh, one way I think we've already seen effective, uh, that's effective to do that, is through uh, the um, administration's emission standards, which we could debate on their own merit. But that it, assuming kind of what you were, you were asking, I think that's a better and a cheaper way to go about doing it. Great. Well, thanks, Emily, for, for your presentation. And I'm sure uh, we'll have some, some questions uh, for you later in the program. Uh, Professor David Levinson is also joining us this afternoon, and uh, he serves on the faculty of the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Minnesota and as director of the Nexus Research Group, which stands for Networks, Economics, and Urban Systems. He holds the Richard P. Braun CTS Chair in Transportation. He's a former transportation planner in uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, one of my old stomping grounds, and has authored or edited several books and numerous peer-reviewed articles. He is the editor of the Journal of Transport and Land Use. Uh, he co-authored a brief for Brookings a few years ago that received a lot of attention entitled Fix It First, Expand It Second, Reward It Third. Uh, he also writes the blog The Transportationist, which I think uh, would be a really cool name for a super villain or something. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Professor Levinson, we are going to hand over control of the, of the presentation to you at this point. Okay. You got my screen? We've got it. Great. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about a paper we did for Brookings. Um, we published this in 2011, which means we wrote it in 2010, and nothing of substance has changed in the transportation financing world in Washington, D.C. since that time. I mean, of course, there has been a new uh, reauthorization bill. Um, but the questions that were pertinent then are still pertinent. And so one of the key points that we want to make is that the transportation system that we have is better than anything else that we might consider building. That is, we've adapted ourselves to a world around our existing transportation system. We could build new links, but most of the new links that we think about building weren't good enough to build already. They had benefit cost ratios below those that we've already built. So the things that we need to be thinking about are how do we preserve the existing system much, is much more important than how do we expand to serve new markets. And there's a variety of reasons for this. We could talk about peak traffic and sort of the, the decline in vehicle miles traveled per person. but we're going to get a lot more benefit about by preserving the existing system than we are going to by expanding it. We deploy the, the U.S. interstate highway system over a period of years, um, beginning in the late 1950s. 50% of it was built by the mid-1960s, which means that 50% of it is 50 years old next year. Uh, the system is aging. You look at the expected life of facilities 
elements of that system, most of those facilities had an expected life of between 30 and 50 years. Many of those facilities have been rebuilt. Some of them have been replaced, but there's a lot still to do. And as the system continues to age, preserving the system, rebuilding the system, recapitalizing the system are going to be the key questions. And we can look at the number of structurally deficient bridges in the National Highway System. This is from a few years ago. Um, hopefully there's a few fewer green dots today, but there's still a lot of them. These are um, bridges that don't do what they should do. Um, they're not on the verge of collapse necessarily, but they're not where they should be. They don't have the, the strength that they, that they should. And road strength, pavement strength, as well as bridge strength is important because those are key limits on freight traffic, for instance. Freight uh, loads per axle are limited by how strong the pavement is, and total truck weights are limited by how strong the bridges are. And it makes a lot of sense to maintain the system rather than to letting it fail because it's a lot less expensive to maintain the system than letting it fail. Um, if, we, if the system gets into a much more deteriorated situation, you have to completely reconstruct it as opposed to doing minor rehabilitations on it. And of course, you don't want the system to fail um, for a variety of reasons. You don't want to be, I mean, obviously you don't want the safety problems associated with it with an immediate failure, but you don't want to have to shut down links by surprise either just because they're on the verge of failure. You want to do this systematically with forethought. And so the system has basically been moving from a, a building which is what we were doing from the 1950s through the 1980s to a system where we're operating and maintaining, and that's the dominant feature of the transportation world that we live in. And so in our proposal, Fix It First, we suggested that the federal gasoline tax no longer fund new highway construction and that the revenue be dedicated to maintaining the national highway system, okay, preserving and reconstructing the existing highways which are, as I mentioned, re reaching the end of their design life. So the, the basic logic is we would continue to have the existing gas taxes um, and put those into a highway trust fund because there's no point in losing a revenue system that people have already agreed upon. Um, and though I'm sympathetic to the arguments that were put forward that this is largely a local issue, and I think certainly much of this is, uh, on the other hand, we already have this source of funding and fighting these political ba battles is very expensive. So we have a highway trust fund. We should have some formula that allocates this across the states and it could be as simple as it goes back to the states in, in the proportion that it was paid in or it could be based on some formula based on need. Um, and those states would uh, use that money only for the national highway system and based on the usage of the system, user fees would be generated which would replenish the highway trust fund. Now, of course, this is at a, we would only propose to spend as much as the highway trust fund was actually taking in, um, and this overspending of the highway trust fund is, is not financially sustainable as, as numerous people have, have discussed before. So the second th point is the expanded second. So there might be some links that, that should be expanded. You might want to build new facilities. Currently, the federal government is primarily in the grant giving business. Um, we're proposing that instead it should be in the financing business, that we think we should think of it more as a, there, there should be a bank where money um, from the federal government is lent to people who are building transportation facilities on the condition that it get paid back. So this would be a self-financing system. Uh, the, there is a market out there for investments with stable rates of return. Um, there is a growing need for stable assets for things like pensions. And so people would be willing to buy bonds. Um, but people who are in the business of building transportation facilities at the state and local level tend to enter the bond market rarely, aren't very good at it, don't have access to capital, and should not be expected to get skilled in all of those things. Um, whereas the federal, a federal bank that could provide uh, basically a lumping of investments and a portfolio of investments that can be sold to bondholders is a different way of thinking about this. So user fees would go to the states to repay loans that they took out from the federal government to finance new transportation facilities. It's important that this is a switch from, from pay as you go to pay as you use. Okay, so this would allow you to say if this project's going to last for 30 years, that users over the course of 30 years would pay for it, 
instead of users from yesterday. Okay, and this is a major change in the transportation world, but this is how large capital investments um, are often funded elsewhere. And the user fees can be things like tolls or mileage-based user fees, um, odometer charges, as well as land value capture. So facilities that create spillover could then um, be taxed to help pay for facilities under by, by local governments or by state governments. And these funds could also be to private toll authorities um, as a financing mechanism. Okay, so this is expanding in second. New highways will continue to be built in places that are still growing. Um, instead of using a grant program, we would have a, a, a loan program where the loans would have to be paid back, and this changes the incentives. Uh, states would be on the hook for paying, paying for the facilities that they, that they want, uh, so they would only want to borrow money for things that they think they're going to want over a long period of time, rather than thinking about something as free money or 80% money or 50% money in the case of transit. Okay. And then rewarded third, um, if performance standards are exceeded, if the project does better than it's expected, um, federal government could have, um, from the profits it generates from the, the loan program, okay, so it's borrowing money from the private markets and lending it to states at somewhat higher interest rates than it's borrowing it, okay, it's generating some revenue there that could be used as an incentive program to improve performance at the state and local level um, to reward those projects that uh, met, did what they said they would do. And this would provide an incentive to states to, to not goose their benefit cost ratios and not um, artificially inflate their demand forecasts and artificially deflate their cost forecasts. Because if you do that, then you're not going to get a reward in the end because you're unlikely to um, outperform. So we need to have some sort of incentive for honesty on the part of those who are borrowing. And so we have a flow chart here. Um, there's investors on the left, lower left corner who are lending money to, we'll call it federal transportation bank. Um, I think of it as a federal highway bank um, or a federal transit bank. Not a general infrastructure bank. I mean, not that there shouldn't be banks for water resources in other areas, but the people who are going to be expert in transportation are not going to be the same people who are expert in other fields. Okay, the federal transportation bank is going to lend to anybody who they think can repay the loan at a given interest rate. Um, and that get, if they think that that's the case, they'll lend money to the project organizer, which may be a state, it might be a local government, it might be a, a private turnpike. Okay. And that project will generate revenue from user fees, value capture, um, or general revenue if it's, a, if it's a government and that's how they want to pay it back, which repays the loans. And that generates profits. The profits um, go into a performance fund, which tests whether the project exceeded its performance standard and then um, provide some sort of discount on the interest rate so the project doesn't have to pay back quite as much as it would have if it didn't exceed its performance standards. Okay. So the Federal Highway Bank, the Federal Transportation Bank would be lending money to um, firms and public agencies that have a re ability to repay loans from their user fees or value capture. Uh, it, would expect, it would be expected to be profitable over the long, long term. Um, and we can think of the whole system as a public-private partnership, if you like that jargon. So that's the basic idea. Um, happy to take questions and unshare my screen. Washington or elsewhere. Oh, Professor, um, yes. one, one question for you. Uh, uh, so th this idea, as you said, has, has been uh, floating around uh, since 2011. Uh, what, uh, what kind of reaction have you had from either folks in Washington or, or elsewhere around the country? Well, I mean, in one sense, it seems like this is sort of inevitable. If there's no willingness to increase tax revenue, um, some of this is inevitable that um, you're, you're not going to be raising additional money. And more, oh, as the system gets more and more mature, more of the money is inevitably going to be, go towards uh, rebuilding the system rather than building extensions to the system. So some people say, yes, this is obvious and this is what we should do. Um, on the other hand, of course, it doesn't get done exactly as we suggest. The idea of a federal highway bank 
Federal Infrastructure Bank has been floating around for a number of years. I think the more recent proposals have been more like ours, which I hope that we've steered the conversation. So in, in previous years, people have been talking about a federal highway bank or federal transportation bank or federal infrastructure bank as something that was a grant giving organization. Um, and we want to make it clear that it's a loan, a lending organization. It's giving loans out with the expectation of being repaid. And it's a very different uh, way of thinking about things because obviously a grant doesn't get repaid and a loan creates an obligation on the part of the borrower. So the incentives are different. Um, but the question is, is there an appetite in Washington to actually um, systematically change transportation policy, or is it just going to sort of allow the status, co status quo to um, run uh, with some entropy until eventually, because nobody is driving gasoline-powered automobiles, there's no federal highway gas tax collected anyway, and then the highway trust fund goes to zero sort of by default. Um, and maybe the system just winds down because there's no willingness to implement the next way of collecting revenue. I, I'm not in Washington. Um, I've lived in Washington, in the Washington area. I'm not in Washington now. So I, the, I, what I know is what I, from talking to people and reading about stuff and, and everything I read is basically the only thing that we can ever expect is the status quo to continue. And, um, and I guess that's going to be true until at some point there's no status quo to continue. So is, if there's a uh, change in the political makeup, political constituencies in Washington, D.C., you might see some willingness to go in other directions. But um, my sense is that it just the system just sort of winds down by default as what actually happens rather than what should happen. Well, thanks, Professor Levinson, and, and uh, please stay with us as well. Uh, we'll see uh, if, if your approach generates some discussion from our audience here in just a few minutes. And uh, as I said at the top, if you have a question or comment for any of our panelists today, you can type it into the GoToWebinar interface at any time, and uh, we're going to collect those and, and read as many as time allows at the end of the event. Uh, I want to turn now to James Corliss. Uh, go on to the next slide there. Uh, he is the director of the Washington, D.C.-based Transportation for America which the T4 America website describes as an alliance of elected business and civic leaders from around the country uh, united to ensure that states and the federal government step up to invest in smart, homegrown, locally driven transportation solutions. Uh, prior to his current position, James was a senior planner for the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in the San Francisco Bay Area, where he managed the agency's efforts to promote smarter growth, transit-oriented development, and uh, mobility options for low-income communities. He authored uh, California's groundbreaking Safe Routes to School Law and legislation that paved the way for smart growth blueprints to become part of the regional transportation planning process throughout the state. Uh, James, Transportation for America recently, go, go on to the next slide, uh, Transportation for America recently uh, put out its, its policy platform for uh, reauthorization, basically. And it's entitled, uh, Building on Map 21, Renewing the Federal Commitment to Transportation. And I thought it might be worth going through the, the policy proposals that, that you all have in there, since uh, many of them speak to these issues about the future of the federal role and so forth. And uh, there are several of these slides here, but, but let's start with the first policy proposal, and that is to strengthen the nation's uh, transportation fund. And uh, the platform argues in favor of a standalone trust fund with dedicated revenues for all modes of, tra of surface transportation, a multi-year commitment of funds, uh, reinvestment in system preservation, and additional revenue for locally driven projects that support economic growth. Why do you think all of that is important? Um, well, thanks, Sean. And can you hear me OK? Can you hear me OK, yeah. Sean? OK, uh -huh. great. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction, and thanks for having uh, me and us on the on the webinar today. I think I think the one thing that you'll hear, uh, perhaps consistently, I was trying to think what kind of unites all of us as speakers, uh, uh, and and I may be the closest to saying uh, that we've we've got a federal program and we need to continue that federal commitment for a number of reasons. Uh, but I actually don't think any of us are saying the status quo is is acceptable. Um, and, and I hope you 
I hope everybody sort of hears that through what, what I'm going to present today. We, as I said, I want to reemphasize, uh, we don't think we're done in terms of a federal commitment. We have sort of certainly completed the interstate highway system, um, but we think uh, the issues of mobility, accessibility, um, uh, cities and suburbs and metropolitan regions whose economies need to function with good 21st century infrastructure uh, is absolutely in the federal interest. And if we actually step away from that commitment in the 21st century, uh, we stand to lose nothing short of our global uh, competitiveness um, and, and the national economy. So having said that, and just for your question in this slide, obviously the first thing, um, uh, the, the first thing that we're, we're concerned about, I think as everybody sort of has been watching, is the, is the highway trust fund itself. And as all the speakers have acknowledged, Congress is really uh, apparently uh, very unwilling to raise the gas tax to really tackle this issue of federal funding. Um, we have a proposal that it, it, the, the bullet points highlight here. Uh, and in many ways, we have taken an all of the above pr approach. We're, we're very specific in calling for either a 17 cent a gallon gasoline tax increase federally, uh, a swap like uh, the state of Virginia just did from a gasoline tax to a sales tax. That would be the equivalent of about 11 percent uh, sales tax on top of the cost of a gallon of gas. Um, and that is, nets you about $30 billion a year. But again, I think as probably everybody knows and your speakers have mentioned already, we're in the hole right now. We're bleeding about $17 billion. We have a program worth about $52 billion a year. We bring in about 35 simply because the gasoline tax hasn't been raised since 1993. People are driving less and cars are becoming more efficient. So that all conspires to uh, have us burn less gasoline and put less gas tax in the trust fund. Um, so we would like that 17 to get back to sort of uh, at least current spending levels to really focus that, as you say, on a lot of maintenance and preservation. But then we also think that there's a, there's a real need um, to develop some innovative competitive programs, um, programs uh, that target things like uh, mobility in the nation's metropolitan regions, which we would argue are the engines of the economy, um, cities, suburbs, not just the bigger cities, but a lot of mid-sized places are increasingly understanding that transportation and infrastructure is really the key to their competitiveness and their ability to be part of the national economy. Um, I, I know uh, Emily uh, mentioned the study on the TIGER program. Uh, we are big fans of competitive grant programs, whether they are the federal program or state programs. We'd actually like to see more state-enabled uh, funding programs uh, that are competitive and merit-based. We can all argue, you know, who, who finally decides what, where the merit is, but I think we need a, uh, a program that is far more performance-driven. Um, and the notion and the, really the past practice of many years that uh, we've really given money out by formula, I don't think serves as well in this regard. So that's one place we would say that this really has to change. And again, as this slide suggests, um, we're big believers, obviously, in multimodal transportation. Um, that includes not just highways and transit, uh, but also includes passenger rail, freight rail. Uh, ports are not really eligible under the current program. So we have siloed this by, by modes, uh, and that's really hampered, I think, a lot of our ability to, to be innovative um, and to fund projects that are actually needed um, to develop um, our economies and, and, and promote mobility. So let's just go through a couple of these slides, because I want to make sure we leave time for questions. If we can go to the next slide. There's a couple of other um, uh, areas of our platform, and all of this is available in more detail on the, uh, the Transportation for America website. That's T, the number four, america.org. I've mentioned freight. Um, I think freight is a great argument for why there still needs to be a national program. Um, my worst, almost worst case scenario, other than the program going broke, is we'd give every state an equal amount of money to, for, for freight because it really doesn't work that way. Freight, just like people, just like the economy actually doesn't, uh, doesn't actually acknowledge political boundaries that we drew a long time ago, whether those are cities or states uh, or counties. Um, it takes almost as long for a ton of freight to get across the city of Chicago as it does to get from the port of LA Long Beach to Chicago. And that in our minds is in a nutshell a little bit of the problem. The major problem that we've got on our hands 
in terms of freight. It's very lumpy. It's very important for the national economy. And if we don't have a smart, strategic, performance-based approach that's multimodal uh, and, and really gets the best projects with the biggest bang for the buck, um, and that means all modes of freight transportation, looking at ports, looking at rail, looking at highways, uh, we're really going to miss out on something I think that everybody acknowledges is increasingly important to make sure that the national economy runs. Next slide. There's a few other parts of our platform that we, uh, we put out uh, the other month. I mean, many of the speakers have talked about public-private partnerships. Uh, and look, I think um, that is something that we believe there's a lot more that can be done. Uh, we don't believe that it's just going to be the public sector, the government, or the, certainly not the federal government that's going to solve all this. While we believe there's a real role for federal investment, we also believe there's a much stronger role for, um, for partnerships with the private sector. That could mean many things, uh, everything from contracting uh, to P3s, um, things like uh, in, in Denver, they've used some, some, I think, really innovative contracting practices around putting, you know, sort of spreading the risk uh, with some of the, the transit lines out in the Denver metro region. Uh, but it also means things like actually partnering with developers. And we've uh, talked about mass transit. We're certainly big believers in public transit. Um, if, if anybody is under the impression that transit doesn't really make much of a dent on traffic, I invite you to come to the next major transit strike in a city in the U.S. Um, and see what havoc it wreaks. It's not pretty. Uh, but it used to be, uh, Emily mentioned that streetcars were private. That's, that's indeed true. They were actually built by developers. And we think we've actually lost that connection over, over time. Um, and we'd like to bring some of that back through value capture mechanisms um, and even providing low interest, low cost loans to things like building uh, retail jobs, housing around transit corridors so we can up that transit riders, uh, that, that the productivity of those corridors, lower subsidies on those corridors, and get those private sector developers more involved get loans to build the line, and then begin to, you won't repay the whole thing with it, but you can do a lot more, we think, in terms of value capture, tax increment financing locally, um, that we can rebuild some of that connection that's been lost, frankly, between private development and, in this case, public transit corridors. There's a lot more that can be done, and I think David's presentation was excellent on the idea of these, uh, these more infrastructure banks. We'd actually like to see more robust state infrastructure banks um, that we also think could be pretty uh, pretty innovative. Next slide. A uh, lot of our, we, we've uh, in many ways, um, about six months ago, we, we kicked off a pretty new effort for our organization, uh, and we put uh, local leaders, local elected leaders, business leaders, and civic leaders at the heart of our effort. Um, it's folks on our advisory board like the Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, the Nashville, Tennessee Chamber of Commerce, the Seattle Chamber of Commerce, Los Angeles Business Council, who we're working with who also understand that this link between getting basically employers reliably to work, uh, uh, employees of all income levels, uh, working with employers, who I think also increasingly understand that our transportation system is really broken um, and it needs to be fixed. Uh, and frankly, states, localities and states themselves aren't going to be able to make this level of investment. Um, but we do believe there ought to be a much stronger linkage uh, with, through sort of job access, access from, by employees to employers, uh, using a lot more innovation, uh, using tax credits, uh, and, and really putting employers back into the mix. This is another type of public-private partnership, I suppose you might say, but putting employers back into the mix um, to develop a much more innovative range of options to be able to get their employees to work reliably on time and, and uh, with, with less stress and hassle. Next slide. Um, there obviously is, too, I think, uh, a lot of, uh, we, we like the phrase disruption, disruptive technologies happening. Uh, and Millie mentioned Lyft and Uber and Sidecar. I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg in these things. And frankly, we have a, a federal transportation program that really is in many ways still stuck in the 20th century. It isn't being as responsive as it needs to be. So we think there's a lot more that can be done with pilot projects, grants for communities, um, to, to test and bring these innovative practices online. Again, I don't think any, anybody believes this is all going to be done entirely by the public sector. Uh, but there is a big divide right now between uh, a lot of the technology and the technology companies um, and a lot of the public sector in terms of providing 
something as traditional as public transportation services or city municipal transportation services. And we do need to think that innovation needs to be brought into the 21st century. And, and some of the, these small kinds of pilot programs could help. Next slide. Uh, and then finally, uh, for us, uh, we think, that, and I can say this as a former transportation planner uh, in the state of California, we really haven't been very good as an industry at actually uh, being articulate about what we buy for our transportation dollars. And I do think this is the future. This is where we're heading. Uh, we're going to have to be competitive against a lot of other types of investments, public and private investments. And so, you know, MAP21 took a first kind of baby step towards performance measures. We think we need to build on those. Those performance measures were fine. They were pretty traditional and pretty limited uh, in terms of, you know, uh, sort of potholes and state of good repair. All important stuff, whether it's transit or, or highways, but we think we could be a little bit more um, uh, bigger picture in silo busting and even bring back a stronger link to uh, economic development, uh, local uh, GDP. That, that link has been broken and I think needs to be measured more accurately uh, when we're arguing, whether it's in Congress or state legislatures or with taxpayers at the ballot box, we're going to have to make a stronger case in the future. And we do think this is something that we need to get better at through the federal program. It shouldn't be top down. We should let states and localities drive a lot of this, but we should demand that uh, we're much more transparent um, and we get out of a little bit of the black box of transportation planning um, and, and really show our lawmakers, policymakers, and the public uh, what we're getting for our dollars. So I'll leave it there because I know we're just about at time. Great. Thank you so much, James. And uh, we're going to uh, we want to get next to, uh, to your questions and comments. Uh, uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you, if you do have one, please enter it into the GoToWebinar interface, and I will direct them to, to one or more of our guests. And uh, um, we have one that, that has come in uh, across the transom here, and uh, it says, uh, uh, if not gas taxes, what are your thoughts on value-added tolling or vehicle miles traveled fees? Uh, and uh, we can open things up here and, and uh, see if anybody has any thoughts on, on either of those. Well, I, I, Sean, this is James. I maybe just start with this because I said we sort of have an all of the above approach. Our, our proposal for Congress and understanding that really Congress follows the states. Let's remember the states started with the gasoline taxes in uh, the, 19, the, the teens, the 1920s. Um, I don't think that Congress is, or the way, they probably won't pass a gas tax increase, unfortunately, as much as I'd like to prove myself wrong. Uh, I think, frankly, we're going to see this kind of bridge period I mean, either David is right, and we're 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 gonna we're gonna begin to suffocate the program just for lack of doing anything, or it's going to be some sort of a general fund sort of transfer that's offset by corporate tax reform, repatriation of offshore profits, and I think that bridge period is going to perhaps lead to in five, seven, eight years uh, some sort of a mileage-based fee, but I think the states are going to have to lead in that, like Oregon is doing. Yeah, I'll take you yeah. back. On. Oh, go ahead. Oh. I, I think that we're going to move in that direction slowly. I think the opportunity comes with electrification of the fleet because everyone can see that if cars with internal combustion engines pay a gas tax, electric vehicles or hybrid electric vehicles must be paying much less. So there can be some sort of surcharge for electric vehicles. And as more and more vehicles become electric, that transition will take place over time. I think trying to do something like a, in a big bang all at once type of proposal, um, hopefully the country doesn't have a stomach for the rollout of um, the recent Affordable Care Act online services suggests that the U.S. isn't going to be very good at doing something like that. Um, so something that we can transition to and phase in gradually I think would be important. Um, Value-added tolling on specific lanes, certainly high occupancy toll lanes is something we've, we've converted most of, or we will have converted most of the HOV lanes in this country to hot lanes at some point, but that's a really small deal, not a big deal. Um, new facilities being constructed as toll lanes is fine. We're doing a lot of that, but there aren't that many new facilities compared to the amount of existing facilities. The big deal is going to come from switching from um, gas tax towards some sort of mileage tax with all sorts of other types of peak period discounting, um, heavy vehicle uh, surcharges, things like that. 
which uh, will allow us to manage the system better. But that's something that's not going to be done overnight in the next few years, certainly. But it's something that we could try to phase in with electric vehicles. And I think that gives us a long 10 to 20 year phase in period, which we probably can handle. Hi, this is Emily. I'd echo that you know, the Congress is not anywhere near ready to do a VMT um, or any big overhaul, uh, including tolling, um, you know, kind of expanding that use. Um, and I, so I'd, I'd echo what uh, the, the kind of the prognosis or the, the um, uh, estimate for what's going to happen, um, being a general fund transfer or something, something small of that nature. Uh, and frankly, I don't think that the kind of American public, you know, the, the, the sentiment on the ground I don't think is in favor of a VMT right now, although there certainly are groups uh, advocating for that that are, are on the ground doing, doing the legwork right now. I think probably looking forward, like you guys have just uh, said, you know, to, to a time down the road when that might be more appetizing. But I would say that you know, from our position, uh, as much innovation that, that can happen at the state level as possible will be a very good thing, whether that's for a VMT, uh, expanded use of tolling. I would much rather have the states pursue that, learn from one another, uh, and do uh, that, that funding kind of new mechanisms on a regional basis rather than creating a whole new federal bureaucracy that uh, I believe would be fraught with the same problems that we see now. I wanted to ask a question about uh, uh, public-private partnerships, and several of you uh, mentioned uh, those. And uh, there's been a fair amount written recently. And I saw an AP article uh, the other day uh, about how with the shift to more uh, availability payment type P3s, um, that states have more of a risk burden these days, and, and so it's important to, to keep the public interest in mind and, and who will be responsible for what in the future if, if things go south and things like that. Uh, does that make some additional oversight uh, more important at, at, at whatever governmental level that, that might occur? This is James. I think what it what it means increasingly, whether it's states or transit agencies or or, or, or MPOs or cities, you're going to have to negotiate deals really well, and either you or somebody else is going to have to provide a lot of oversight. I, I do think it's a it's one of the many ways in which our institutions are going to have to change, and some are to give them a lot of credit. But uh, negotiating those deals is really important so that you understand. Uh, how much risk you're taking on yourself versus um, the person you're earning into a contract with. Yeah, I, I mean, clearly oversight is important. Um, it's important to, I mean, a lot of these deals have not done well, um, have gone south, um, to, not to pick on my southern friends. Um, the worst one exa example, not in the U.S., in the U.K., was the attempted privatization of the London Underground, um, where Went, had a variety of problems, and they spent a lot of time trying to negotiate the terms and the risks and so on. And they still, and I, I read that they had spent something about 500 million pounds in lawyers' fees, which is a, you know, roughly a billion dollars, a little bit less than a billion dollars at the time. And it's still the the it went bankrupt and was taken it was taken over again by Transport for London, the public agency, because the revenues and the costs of the thing could not be adequately forecast. And when it, if, it, if it stops being profitable for the private firms involved, they're going to walk away from the deal. And someone's going to, assuming you still want to have that service, someone else is going to have to provide it. So I think you have to be very careful about it when you're, when you're dealing with privatization, um, what's in it for the government. Um, and if you have a model that you can emulate, that's going to be a lot better than trying to invent everything. I mean, part of the problem with that was they were trying to invent how to privatize underground systems while operating them in real time and overhauling them in the middle of the night, um, and it, which was not a, a strategy for success. You know, a road is a simpler thing, but you still have problems where non-compete clauses. Your private firm trying to buy a turnpike, you don't want the state to build a parallel road that will t take away your traffic. If you're the state and you see congestion, you don't want your hands tied by the private firm with a no-compete clause. So there's a lot of these problems in public-private partnership, which certainly there's some advantages in terms of gaining capital, but it needs to be done very, very carefully. Could I pile on to that? This is Red Agarwal. Um, you know, I think the 
One of the key things that we in this country have lost sight of when we look at privatization examples around the world is that uh, the access to capital is not often the key source of value creation when those take place well. Um, and a far more prevalent in the landscape of public-private partnerships in, in Europe and Asia is not so much the asset sale, um, you know, in the, in the way that the Chicago uh, Skyway or, or the Indiana Toll Road was privatized, but rather in the adoption of the corporate form. You know, and I think there's an interesting question to be asked there, um, you know, in terms of, say, a turnpike authority. Does it make sense to sell the road, or does it make sense to organize the turnpike authority as a private corporation and IPO a portion of it? But you don't even have to sell off the majority, right? You can actually a bit have your cake and eat it, too. You know, one of the world's great examples of a privatized quote-unquote transit system is Hong Kong's MTRC, but if you look at the details, 75% of the shares are owned by the government of Hong Kong, right? So it adopts the private form. It has access to private sources of capital, um, but in fact, ultimately, the public sector still is in control and, to your point, Matt, still bears the risk if things go wrong because this is a strategic piece of infrastructure. Well, uh, we have one last question, uh, and it is from uh, uh, someone on the webinar today, and uh, Senator Nancy Todd, who is the uh, chair of the Senate Transportation Committee in Colorado. Uh, she writes in and says, in Colorado, we have the Tabor Amendment, uh, and her question is, how do we get the public, um, how do we get the public input to understand the severity of funding for transportation? Uh, we shut down the federal program for a year. <laughs> I, I'm sort of not kidding. I mean, we you know we we used to think it was having a couple bridges collapse. Apparently, that that didn't do much. Um, uh, it is a. Uh, I think it's a. For those of us that have been in this business for a while, it's a, this perennial question about you know we're we're never number one, two, or three on people's lists. We're we're always going to be sort of the the thing that's sort of hidden in plain sight. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 while I'm a big believer in the federal investment, that we've got to sort of rethink the federal investment in partnership with localities and states, um, I'm also a big believer in um, what he was saying earlier about the you know, lo local ballot measures and the, especially out west and a lot of more states that where we have more ballot measures, you know, building those coalitions and going to the ballot and having to ask the public to tax themselves for transportation is not a bad thing. Uh, for us to have to go through. I know it's not fun if you lose, um, but actually trying to justify our investments and be transparent with the public and really try to sell that. Um, and I know Colorado has, has had this experience, as has uh, many other western states, Salt Lake City, probably one of the best examples, but Phoenix close behind um, many western cities. I don't know that we want to necessarily go to the ballot nationally for, for transportation, but I think uh, we need to we need to take some of the lessons learned out of those local ballot campaigns and measures. We need to broaden the tent. Uh, I think we need to make a much stronger connection to economic development, um, and we need to get much different messengers out there talking about this. It can't be the folks that are sort of the usual suspects that are um, are, are going to you know are in the business and going to make a profit for, from these uh, the, these projects and this work. It's it's got, it's got to be a much different set of messengers that has to get that across the public. Yeah, I, I have a somewhat different take, which is that I think we sh when you think about transportation, you think about transit systems, you think about roads, they're functionally very similar to other public utilities like electricity or gas or telecom, which we organize very differently. So then the question is, why do we do that? And it's historical reasons, mostly. Um, and transit systems, um, you know, are private or quasi-private in, in much of the world and are public utilities in other places. Uh, turnpikes are more like utilities than state DOTs. So 
people pay a monthly bill to their utility and they might grumble a little bit, but they realize that if they don't pay their bill, they don't get their lights. We have hidden the charges for transportation into a gas tax that is not explicitly made clear at the gas pump. Um, and people don't realize that it's usually in most states and certainly at the federal level is dedicated to transportation. It's not always dedicated to highways as per Emily's point. Um, but if we would instead organize it like a public utility, it could be a publicly owned public utility or with some private um, ownership share as well. I mean, that, those are details that people would recognize that they have a bill to pay and they pay it and the utility would go to the Public Utilities Commission to ask for a rate increase instead of the state legislature, um, which, you know, from a somewhat cynical pro-transportation point of view, I think would make it easier to raise money, but would also lead to better governance because you'd have somebody, you'd have sort of a, a, a more, hopefully a more nonpartisan, more objective look at the proposed rate increases you know, be they gas taxes or user fees um, or, you know, odometer charges or whatever we have in the future. And that reorganizing state DOTs and transit agencies as public utilities that clearly had a source of funding that people explicitly paid for, people shouldn't have to worry about the infrastructure crisis. They don't want to think about the, elect the electricity crisis. Uh, they don't want to think about the natural gas pipeline crisis or the water pipe crisis or those wastewater treatment crisis, okay? They want to pay their bill and have somebody else deal with it. Well, they should pay their bill and have somebody else deal with transportation. They should just be using it and not have to think about the intricacies of it. And the way we do that is we transform how we govern it so it's not a branch of state government, but it's a semi-autonomous or fully autonomous uh, public utility. Let me piggyback off the, the kind of a comment that was made about, um, you know, what happens if we shut down the federal program. I'm not advocating that at all, but it brings up a good point. I think we've actually already, over the last several years, seen a, a period of, shall we say, not shutdown, but slowdown in, uh, in growth of the federal transportation program. And we've actually gotten a glimpse of what the state's responses would be uh, under kind of a more active uh, devolution, turn back, whatever you want to call it, turnover of the responsibilities to the states and localities and private sector. Um, it's already been discussed, the host of states that have either raised their gas taxes at the state level, um, engaged in P3s, done revenue bond measure, you know, just all, a whole variety of things um, and mechanisms whether to finance or to simply just fund, much like the current funding system works. Um, we've actually seen, gotten a glimpse of what that would look like and I think um, you know, as was mentioned at the very beginning, if the federal government were to put the states on notice um, and and say, uh, here, you've got X number of years to uh, start making the changes necessary at your level. Here's what we're going to do at the federal level to pare down the, the federal uh, the size of the federal program. Um, certainly, P3s would be part of the equation, I believe, at the state level, much as they are now. Um, my last kind of just little point on that is that we, I, I would say, we need to be careful. Um, at the federal level of identifying a success at the state level with a P3 and thinking that it is perfectly fine to um, scale that up uh, and, and have it at the federal level. It doesn't always work that way. So any time that's done needs to be uh, done very carefully. Great. Well, we are past our time, so thanks everybody for sticking around this afternoon. Uh, that's all the time we have for today's uh, Policy Academy on the future of the federal role in transportation. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us. Uh, go on to the next slide there. Uh, we can uh, put up our, this is how you can follow all, all of us on Twitter, including myself down there at the bottom. And in case you missed uh, any part of today's webinar or want to listen back, it will be archived in the CSG Knowledge Center and expect to see that probably the week of June 9th. Uh, thanks to everybody who logged on this afternoon and joined us. Uh, I'm Sean Sloan at CSG headquarters in Lexington. Have a good rest of your afternoon.